You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Welcome back to Faith and Other Oddities. Um, we are still doing that thing we do in the studio where we talk about the Bible. Even the parts we don't want to. <laughs> Even the parts we don't want to. Um, we are technically past probably the most graphic part of the story, but we might reference it throughout uh, a little bit. So I do want to put that disclaimer out mm-hmm. again at the front. Um, we just finished up with the Levite uh, distributing the parts of his yeah. concubine's body around. And we're getting to look at some of the consequences of that. I think we kind of started to touch on that last week with uh, all of the the elders and the nation coming together to talk about what they were going to do about it. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to talk about what they were going to do about it. Right. Yeah. We were, we were really kind of in the middle of his speech to the, to the nation and saying, Hey, you know, these men were trying to kill me. We talked about how he was uh, manipulating the circumstances. He was leaving out the fact that they were, um, not there to kill him, they were there to rape him, and that, you know, just somehow his concubine managed to be violated, and she's dead. And his whole speech about this is not the speech of a grieving man. This is the speech of someone who's just upset that his property was damaged. And you just, you don't have any sympathy for him at all, because why in the world is he not more distraught about the fact that this horrible thing has been done to her? Mm-hmm. But of course, he was he was part of it. He was a major reason that this did happen to her because he was the one who shoved her out the door. And he he made the insinuation that it was the lords of Gibeah, that it was the, the noblemen. Mm-hmm. And the Bible did not call them that. The Bible had called them the, the sons of Leal and that they were the worthless men of Gibeah. Now, what that entailed as far as their social status, we don't know. Right. So, it, you know, it could have been just a group of, of worthless men who lived in Gibeah, or it could be that the leaders were worthless, the worthless men. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, imagine that leaders that are not worth, uh, <laughs> right. much anyway. So, uh, sounds like you're gonna get political if we keep going that route. No, that's all. I'm, <laughs> I'm done. That's all I'm going to say. You can apply that however you like. <laughs> So in verse six and seven, he, he continues with his speech and he says, so I took hold of my concubine and cut her into pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed an abomination and outrage in Israel. Behold, you people of Israel, give me your advice and counsel here. So, you know, he's, he's using some really polished language to explain his outrage, what's going on, but nowhere in the speech does he mention God. Right. He's a Levite. God should have been the first words out of his mouth and appeal to God to, to correct this. Nowhere does he reference the Torah in any of this. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a weird speech because he uses Torah language such as abomination, which in, in the Torah, abomination almost always refers to a sexual sin mm-hmm. or something to do with sacrifice. And the fact that he uses this word correctly Right. The the word is definitely in the right place, but why? Why is he not referencing God? And he even calls the sons, uh, the the people of Israel, the Hebrew there is the Bnei Yisrael, the sons of Israel. Hmm. And so contrast that with the sons of Leal. And he's he's making that distinction. You know, you're good, you're righteous, you're holy, because you are the sons of Israel, compared to these worthless men who did this, or the sons of Leal who did this to my my wife. Yeah kind of working something out there with with the whole uh the bible calls them sons of Bleal, but uh he calls them the sons of israel well and... he calls the the ones coming to respond oh to the, the, the sons mm-hmm. of israel okay mm-hmm. sorry he's appealing was, to their ego i thought i thought okay yep got you now i thought mm-hmm. i was thinking you were saying he was calling the the people who attacked him you know also mm-hmm. sons of israel but yeah. that I was thinking, well, and they were and well, that's <laughs> that's the yeah. disturbing part yeah i know and that's well that's the thing it's like yeah, you know, and we talked about that, you know, when the sons of Israel act like the sons of Bleal, and I was thinking, like, when we, but then, then it gets worse if we, if we start calling people who act like the sons of Bleal, sons of God. Right. Um, 
and, and insisting that they are, but that's a whole nother thing. And well, but I mean, it, it's a valid topic. I mean, when we, when we are acting like, you know, worthless people instead of the sons of God, you know, who are we, who are we really, no matter what title we call ourselves, do our actions really show who we are? Right. And so he, he is saying that you as the sons of Israel need to stand up and you need to execute judgment. But because he fails to mention God or the Torah, it seems like he's really calling for a secular judgment, even though the nation is responding as if they need to have a spiritual judgment. Mm -hmm. And it's really this weird dichotomy of what's going on within the group versus what he's saying. And, you know, he, his words, they're, they're scary because he's, he, behold, that's mm -hmm. his first word. I mean, when you hear that in Judges, you should cringe every time you have behold. This isn't just yeah. look. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to take a moment and really talk about how bad this is. Yeah. And the, the nation, they respond. They, they say, hey, yeah, we're going to go up against Gibeah. We're going to figure out who's going to go first. And they, in verses 8 through 11, they, they discuss the lot system that, you know, they're going to cast lots to see who's going to go first. Mm -hmm. And this reminds us of chapter 1. Now, the problem with chapter, with it reminding us of chapter one, there were no lots. They just went to inquire of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like they have a conversation with God in that moment. Right. Now they're having to resort to the lots because God's not talking. And this tells you how far the nation has strayed, where they have gone from this conquest in Canaan and going through the desert where the angel of the Lord was with them mm -hmm. and he was fighting alongside of them. Now God's completely silent. What's happening here? How, how bad are they right. that God would desert his covenant people? And if you'll notice, if you stop and read through there, which I'm not going to take time to do, their question is, who shall go up? Mm -hmm. Not should we? Not is this the right thing to do? They just decide to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And they decide it's the right plan and they organize ways to get provision and food and everything. Let's recap the plan real quick, because we've, <laughs> we've mentioned that they decided it's the right plan, but what is their plan? <laughs> uh, well, their plan is to go up at Gibeah. At this point, they haven't really specifically said exactly how they're going to do it. Uh, they actually pauses, they pause in verse 12 and 13 to go to the tribe of Benjamin, because Gibeah is in Benjamin's land. Mm -hmm. And they said, hey, this happened. This needs to be addressed. And... Benjamin says, mm -mm, no, uh, we're, we're not going to do it. Literally, it says we're not going to listen to the voice of our brothers. Hmm. So Benjamin decides, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. And we're reminded that just like the men of Gibeah would not listen to the voice of their brother, the old man who stood out and said, hey, brothers, don't do this wicked and vile thing. Mm -hmm. Benjamin is now saying, no, we're, we're not going to listen to you either. Right. So Gibeah actually is a representation of Benjamin's attitude as a tribe. Sure. So now this doesn't set well with the rabbis because, you know, you don't want anyone in Israel to look like an evil person. You're always going to do your best to make it look better. And I think I mentioned before that they really went out of their way to try to say, oh, Benjamin wanted to handle this in-house. Mm -hmm. That there's no statement of intent. Right. There's nothing that gives any indication that they were going to do that. And it looks like the, the rest of the tribe is going to have to step in. Now, if you have a king who's ruling over the entire nation, then he automatically has the right to step in and deal with any situation within the tribes. Right. You don't have a king who has the right to go into another tribe and exact judgment. Well, I mean, if, if they were acting like family, then anyone in the family, but they're not. <laughs> no, they're not. And... It is interesting that when the rest of the tribes go to Benjamin and they talk about this man, they revert back to the B'nai B'lial. They do not use lords of Gibeah. Right. They acknowledge that these guys really are worthless. So. Well, you know, and I think regardless of title, if I had heard <laughs> about someone doing that, I would probably refer to them as worthless as well. I mean, just. We might have a few more creative words for him too. Well, yeah. Might be <laughs> one, of the, one of the few things that might come out of my mouth. <laughs> right. So. Verse 15 through 17, this is when we start to get kind of into that battle plan you were asking for. And we have this breakdown of the warriors who were there. And we talk about their, their qualifications as warriors. I'm not going to read the verse. I'm just going to give you some numbers so you kind of get an idea of the scope of this battle. You have 33,000 
swordsmen, 700 from Gibeah on the opposing side. Uh, there's left-handed sling throwers from Benjamin that were 700, so we're reminded of Ehud there. Uh, against the rest of Israel, uh, 400,000 swordmen, men of war. I'm sorry, that 33,000 and the 700 from Gibeah were actually Benjamin. And then against the rest of Israel were 400,000 swordmen. So you got 400,000 against 33,000 pretty much. And the war is going to have three battles. And this is how it's going to be engaged in, uh, that there's going to be this very strategic um, move going on that I've skipped over a lot of that because honestly, warfare kind of bores me. Yeah. So <laughs> I focused on the, the dialogue and the events between the battles. Yeah. It's like the third Matrix movie. They just spent way too long on that <laughs> battle. <And you're laughs> Like, yeah. Get, get to the point. Well, I, I'm horrible when we watch like um, action movies or war movies at home, like during the battle, I'm like reading a book or playing a game. But then when, when they go back to the dialogue, then I tune in and see what's going on. So I kind of do the same thing here. Yeah. But um, verse 18, the people go to Bethel. They've left Mizpah and they're at Bethel to inquire of the Lord who shall go up against the people of Israel. And the Lord, now he speaks and he says, Judah shall go up first. Now. Again, not the right question, not should we go, who should go. Mm -hmm. And God answers the question, but he doesn't answer the question they should have asked. He answers the one they did, did ask. ask. Yeah. So this is like a total dad move too. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, do, I do that with the kids all the time. Yeah. yeah. They'll say, I'm hungry. And they're like, okay, what do you want to do about that? Mm -hmm. Or <laughs> Yeah. It, it will, and yeah, use your words wisely. Exactly. Yeah. And Judah is the right choice. And the reason why I say Judah's right choice, not just because God said it, but, you know, God had reasons for saying it. In chapter one, they're the first ones to go into Canaan to conquer. Mm -hmm. Right. But also the concubine was from Bethlehem in Judah. And so Judah was actually the first ones to do wrong in the situation, because if they had trained her father better, if they had kept their people grounded in Torah, if they had protected their women, mm -hmm. then she would not have been married to this man who would have abused her. Fair enough. So they're, they're actually culprits, even though they're kind of culprits by proxy almost. But this is the thing about the story. Everyone in the story is the same as everyone else. Mm -hmm. It's that uniformity. So all the fathers in Judah were not taking care of their daughters. Makes and, sense. Yeah. So Judah goes out and basically they get their butts kicked. And like I said, they, they were culprits, so they should have. This is right. This is the good thing. Um, the tribe of Judah kills 22,000 Israelites. I'm sorry, the tribe of Benjamin kills 22,000 Israelites. So 400,000 versus um, the 33,000, and they kill 22,000. I mean, th this small army decimates the, the, the warriors who go out. Well, if you look at also, I mean, this is, it's, you know, you have swordsmen versus sling throwers too. Mm -hmm. So you've got, uh, you know, infantry versus artillery here mm -hmm. is, is basically what you've got. So you're actually going to, they're actually going to have a bit of an advantage with the, the sling. Yeah. And evidently the left-handed sling throwers were like amazing beyond just a right-handed sling thrower. And this was kind of a, a traditional thing that the left-handed um, warriors were actually just superior. Mm. And so that's, kind of an interesting thing. If you do get into the warfare side, you can look further into that. It, here, it's just a point of curiosity. Uh, well, I mean, it, it is It is also, I mean, if the if the sling throwers were also trained to use swords at close combat, it is actually, I, I've heard from some people who do like stage combat, mm -hmm. that it is very awkward fighting if a, a left-handed person. Right, yeah. So that's just... Well, you know, you you set up and you're mentally prepared to to take on someone who's going to meet you in a certain way, and then to suddenly have that out the window. Now you not only have the advantage of how you're fighting, but also the fact they're off kilter mentally. Right. And well, well it, yeah, and you, I mean, because the the position of the body is different mm -hmm. uh, when you're when you're changing hands like that, and you're having to think through every emotion have, now. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, and the the and the advantage the left handed person has over the right handed person is they are used to fighting right handed people typically. Right. Where the right handed person is used to fighting right handed people exactly. as well. So that's yeah. uh, <laughs> a little side note from my. Uh, uh, a random society sources. of creative <laughs> anachronisms. Um. <laughs> yeah, but, well, that's us. 
So battle two, Israel gets smarter and they, they set up their battle line. And before they actually engage, they go and they weep before the Lord and they ask a better question. Should we go up against our brother? Mm. And, you know, Israel's kind of waffling a bit because they're realizing, number one, we may not win this. Mm -hmm. Number two, this is really causing damage within the nation as a whole. And they don't want to do this. And they realize, you know, these are their brothers dying. This is the civil war Mm -hmm. all over again. And God says, go on. You know, you started it. You got to finish it pretty much. This time, 18,000 Israelites are killed. There's no mention of Benjamin's uh, losses. And then 26 through 28, it says, now everyone goes to Bethel and weeps, fasting and offering sacrifices to God. And we learn two important things in this section. One is that the Ark of the Covenant's now at Bethel and not at Shiloh. And the priest presiding over these sacrifices is Phinehas. Now, we've talked about Phinehas before. Phinehas is the grandson of Aaron. Mm -hmm. And so... Why is he here? It can only be because the timing is such that he's still alive. Mm -hmm. And we know that he had actually, uh, he was present during the wanderings in Cana. He was there with Joshua during the conquest. Mm -hmm. And he's still in Israel. So Phinehas, who had been so zealous for God that he was willing to stab one of his own Israelite brothers who brings a Moabite woman into camp Mm -hmm. and is praised for his zeal by God, is now presiding over this nation that has no concern about God until they need him. Mm -hmm. What's going on with Phineas? Where has been his guiding voice in this? Why hasn't he been speaking up during any of this? And, and, you know, these Levites that are wandering around would have been his pupils. Right. They they would have understood what's going on because he would have been one who taught them. Mm -hmm. So this is telling you this is this problem it is bad and it got bad quick. Right. And once again, just like with the last Levite, who was the grandson of Moses, we're, we're getting the understanding that this is quick and it's not, you know, the, the important people are not immune to it. Sure. So, um, but we also have another question as to why is the Ark of the Covenant at Bethel? We, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, th- nobody does. The only thing we can figure out is that it was brought from Shiloh specifically for this time and for this purpose. Now, we know that uh, it was not uncommon for the Ark to go into battle with the Israelites. We saw that in Numbers 14, 39 through 45. Sure. And in 1 Samuel 4, it's going to happen again. And we know that later it's returned to Shiloh. So we think it was brought out specifically for this battle so that the people could inquire of God and, you know, they're going to ask all the wrong questions, but hey, at least they're talking to God. And this is the first time in a long time because nobody's talking to God really in Micah and the Levite with the Danites and the Levite mm-hmm. and the last two chapters. So finally, we're getting somewhere at least. And that's kind of been a big deal for us to get back to the place where we can actually talk to God. And so they they offer these these sacrifices. and then. 29 through 35, we have battle three, and Israel attacks again. Benjamin has no clue that God has promised a victory this time. He says that, you know, he, he is going to, to give them the win. And 25,000 men from the tribe of Benjamin were killed. Verse 35, um, it says, And the Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel, and the people of Israel destroyed 25,100 men of Benjamin. Now. The wording's very specific. God defeats Benjamin. Israel destroys Benjamin. Mm -hmm. This is is where the problem begins to unravel for this particular set of battles. Uh, Now, there's some more things that happen. There's some more battles going on, verses 37 through 48. There's specific breakdowns of individual skirmishes and how how many men died the methodologies and the attacks and what's important there. And I'm not going to make the connections, but if you want to take that section uh, 37 through 48 and go back to Joshua 8, 19 through 24, Mm -hmm. you're going to find that this lines up with Joshua's battles very, very well. Okay. So we're being reminded that the important thing here with Phineas and the way the battles are fought, we're being reminded that this lines up with the conquest of Canaan. And 
this is important because of what's going to be happening as we go forward. The, in verse 48, and the men of Israel turned back against the people of Benjamin and struck them with the edge of the sword, the city, the men, the beast, and all that they found, and all the towns that were found were set on fire. So we've got absolute destruction of all the cities of Benjamin. The people, the homes, the ability to feed themselves, they're gone. And this style of warfare is a harem. It, it's uh, devoted to destruction. Mm-hmm. And this is what God's commanded pe- the people of Israel to do when they entered into Canaan. So in Deuteronomy 7, 2, he tells them, hey, you know, you need to devote them to destruction. Cherem, uh, 2016, also in Deuteronomy, shall save nothing that breathes, and you shall devote them to complete destruction. Now, I wanted to pause here for a second because this is the point where Bible critics say, hey, this just proves that your God is a bloodthirsty monster that he would tell the people to go kill everyone in Canaan. Right. And that's just not true. And you're like, wait a minute. Okay, I just cited verses that, that said that's what they're supposed to do. A couple of points to, to be made. There's a limit on which tribes, which Canaanites, should be devoted to destruction. Mm-hmm. There's only specific tribes. The rest of them would be driven out. Right. There's only a few that are supposed to be uh, totally destroyed. The ones that are on the list, which, by the way, you can find that list in Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 5, are wicked nations. Right. And this, I think we've touched on this before mm-hmm. because, you know, one of the critics, uh, well, I say critics, detractors more because mm-hmm. I want, I, I think that's probably a better term because I want to. Right. Because oftentimes, it, you know, I don't want to confuse that with like <laughs> literary, liter, uh, you know. That makes sense. Literary criticism. Valid criticism. Yeah. Um you know, like textual critics, mm-hmm. you know, that, that business, but it, the, you know, the, the detractors uh, of, of scripture would, you know, they, I think, I think you've mentioned this before. I don't know if it was on the program or, or just in conversation Who knows with us? that, you know, one of the things they complain about is that God would, would uh, tell them to kill all the animals and all the, the children. Mm-hmm. And that the thing is a lot of the women and children and animals were using cultic practices and that's, Part of the, why that would be that they would be devoted Absolutely. to destruction and not just driven out. Yeah. And, and then that's the thing. When you, when you realize what was going on here, that the ones who were told, that God told them to completely destroy, th- these are uh, wicked nations, the wickedest of nations. And they're not innocent people living out their lives, but they're wicked. Mm-hmm. And the Bible doesn't use that word lightly. And Leviticus 18 which if you know your Bible, this is the uh, who you should or should not sleep with chapter. They identify the offenses as abominations so heinous that the land itself is going to vomit out the Canaanites. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is, this is the problem. And it's interesting that in Leviticus 18, what they're addressing there are sexual sins, the adultery, homosexuality, incest, bestiality, all the things that in ancient Israel are viewed as women's rights issue. Mm-hmm. If you're going to respect and honor a woman, well, then you don't cheat on her. Sure. If you're going to respect and honor a woman, then you preserve marriage. Because in every society at this point where homosexuality had become a big issue, then women started becoming used simply as broodstock. Mm-hmm. So this was mm-hmm. a way to protect the place of women. And then, of course, you know, I don't think I have to tell you bestiality, not honoring women, neither is child sacrifice. So the... The primary focus of Leviticus 18, when it's talking about how wicked these nations are, is talking about the honor of women. Sure. And that makes sense. Yeah. I, I was, when I was thinking about that and putting it together, I was just like, wow, no wonder this, this all ties together. So the other thing about this style of warfare, an individual could exempt themselves. Uh, we saw that with Rahab. We saw that with Caleb. We see it with Othniel. Mm-hmm. If you are from outside of, of the Israelite tribes or the Israelite country and you want to become a part of the nation of God, you just have to repent mm-hmm. and, and God accepts you. And the fourth thing with this, upon arrival to Canaan with these tribes, they were met with violence. Israel was met with violence. They did not go out and attack these nations first. The, these nations actually came out to meet Israel. So it could be that when God says destroy them, he's warning them. Mm-hmm. This is this is what's going you're going to be met with and you can see that in Joshua 9 1 through 2, Joshua 10 1 through 5, 
and 11, one through five. So, um, you know, it, it's documented. Okay. Um, that is interesting. Yeah. And fifth, the, 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 these tribes were descendants of the Nephilim and the Rephaim. Right. So they are not just human beings that are making mistakes. These are wicked um, giants that, you know, their sins include such things as child sacrifice, sexual violence, and cannibalism. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, <laughs> cannibalism is in there too. <laughs> yeah. And so this is, this is the reason why they could not be allowed to remain. It is because what they're doing is so heinous and it's so destructive, not just to themselves, but to everyone around them, that it has to be stopped. And so only these people in, in those particular circumstances were, were supposed to be devoted to destruction. And it was designed to keep Israel safe from both acts of naked aggression, but also that subtle corruption. Right. And it was the, you know, it's, it's their failure to follow through on this that has brought them to this place now. And now, I, I do want to make it clear that this is, this is Israel's charge in right. taking the land. Right. I, I want to make sure we are clear on mm-hmm. this, that it, the church today, we are not on the same <laughs> right. mission that Israel was on. We have a we, new. We are, we have a, yeah, we're not going in to conquer a land. We are now, we're, our, mm-hmm. our command is to, uh, is to love our neighbors and love our enemies. Yeah. Um, that's what you know, that's kind of where Jesus we bottom are, lined it. You know, it, it's not, yeah. So I, I, I just want to make sure we're not, no one's thinking, oh, well, this is what we're supposed to do. Oh, right. I don't want anyone using anything we say to think that we should be inciting violence. And I think I've said earlier, you know, err on the side of kindness, you know, love yeah. your neighbor. Don't, well, and you don't use anything we say as an excuse to, <laughs> right. to harm anyone. Please. And, and that's the thing we, we have to, this is, I will say, this is like you were saying that this is a time that we have to realize that this was a different time and era. And there mm-hmm. are some places in the Bible where you have to look at the, the context. And this is a totally different context. And, you know, I would say until we start having people rising up with swords trying to kill us, then we probably just need to continue with more of a that, that kind, gentle approach and continuing to live yeah. in truth and honesty and integrity. That's yeah. offensive enough to people around you. Um, so but that's... Yeah. But... So, yeah, I just, I just want to throw that out there because I don't want anyone to think we're... Yeah. We want to incite any kind of mm-hmm. violence or whatnot. Well, <laughs> well, and that's the thing what's going on here, even in this situation, because this is what they were supposed to do when they arrived in Canaan. This is how they were supposed to handle it. Now they're doing it with their brothers. Mm-hmm. They're, they're practicing this methodology of destruction against the people who they're supposed to be protecting and joining with to create this nation so the Messiah can come. Right. And instead, they're destroying themselves. And the way that the, the writer utilizes these portions of uh, Joshua and Deuteronomy to, to highlight what they're doing, he's saying, this is how messed up it is. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. couldn't be obedient to destroy God's enemies, but now they're going to destroy their brothers. Mm. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And this is a huge portion. If you go back and you look at the stories of the Watchers and they fight and war against, or the children of the Watchers, they fight and war against each other. And this is what causes devastation in the earth. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they really are acting like Benabliya. They're acting like the sons of this God who's worthless in comparison to God. Right. And, you know, and, and the thing is, God still enacts judgment on the nation. Mm-hmm. And he's doing it by letting them destroy themselves. He says, if you're going to act this way, he tells them in Deuteronomy, you don't do what's right. I'm going to curse you. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be consequences. And he's letting them bring the consequences on themselves. And, you know, Judah gets their butt whipped because they failed to protect the women. Mm -hmm. And even though it was Benjamin's tribe who acted, now Benjamin is facing the consequences for their aggression against women. and it's it, we're seeing the whole nation being depleted in strength and numbers mm-hmm. in particular Benjamin, but this is God's divine justice without him having to lift a finger. Right. And the thing is no one in the entire nation is exempt. Yeah. So we're moving on to, to chapter 21 at this point. 
And it says, now the, the men of Israel had sworn at Mizpah, no one shall give us, shall give, sorry, no one of us shall give his daughter in marriage to Benjamin. This is the first time we hear anything about this vow. Right. And I think what the, the um, writer is doing and other commentators agree that he's withheld this because we're supposed to be shocked by it. Mm -hmm. The same way that Israel like snaps out of their stupor and goes, oh, what have we done? Right. You know, this is, this is a bigger problem than we anticipated. And they are suddenly worried about their brother. They have gone from wanting to destroy them to we need to save them. Yeah. Which is, which is kind of a weird turn of events in general. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also kind of weird because they're going to be so adamant about keeping this vow and making sure they don't give their daughters to the, the Benjaminites so that they can rebuild their tribes. But they had absolutely no problem intermarrying with the Canaanites. Right. So once again, we're seeing how messed up this is. Everything that they were supposed to do to the Canaanites that were on that list, now they're doing it to themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and why can we see be, why can we be so I don't even know what that word was. Why can we be so holy and devout in policing our own in this crazy off kilter uber holy and pious way while we dealt with the foreign nations who were God's enemies? Eh, no big deal. Right. You know, but I see this in churches today. Where if somebody in a church makes a mistake, and I'm not talking about anything heinous, I mean, just, just makes a mistake, mm -hmm. we, we will turn on our own in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, someone misspeaks in a, in a sermon. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean uh, who was the guy? Uh, Andy, was it Andy Stanley? Who, he, he phrased something about uh, detaching the church from the Old Testament. Warback? I can't remember, but, uh, but anyway, it, unhitching the, the old Testament from, 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 from the new Testament mm -hmm. church and the way, the way he phrased it sounded way worse than it was. Yeah. And people just went oh, after him. I went and, off when I first heard it. And yeah, I mean, I was, I was pretty upset, but he, he did come back and explain it. And unlike mm -hmm. other people who, you know, gave explanations for things, he actually explained what he meant. And, and what he, what he was saying makes sense because, and, and part of that too, I think is, I'm going to get a little technical here, but <laughs> I think part of that too is his yeah, emphasis is evangelism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I get. And, and basically what he was trying to say is if, if the old Testament stuff, um, keeps someone from hearing the message of Jesus, mm -hmm. then maybe we shift our, our emphasis a little bit is what he was trying to say. Yeah. And he just, I think he just phrased it poorly because, you know, our, that, but you know, where, where you and I, we, our emphasis is on teaching, mm -hmm. which this is, I'm going to go on a little <laughs> rant here. Okay. Right. So, um, but anyway, I'm going to wrap that up first, but yeah, as soon as he said that, like everybody just went after him and in in a lot of unfair ways but anyway so that being said there there is um this is one of my like rants but um you know our emphasis is more on like teaching and mm -hmm. and study and things like that and one of the things that i do think the church needs to work on is not elevating strictly evangelism as the highest <laughs> thing right because we do need people who who understand the Bible mm -hmm. and people who can, can explain it. And, right. and we need to work better at, instead of saying, okay, you're a believer now, now you have to be an evangelist mm -hmm. because the Bible does talk about people who are mm -hmm. gifted in different areas and them working together and our evangelist friends, we love you so much. Right. Um, you know, you, they tend to be the Uber extroverts. <laughs> right. Um, but you know, we need to, we need to work together, you know, mm -hmm. the our evangelist friends work on getting people mm -hmm. into, uh, getting them with people who are good teachers and know how to study. And, you know, from there, you're going to, if you, if you educate your people and what they're gifted at, I think the whole church is going to grow in a more healthy right. way. Um, 
That's just a rant. We Uh, don't need a million hands or a million feet. We actually need the entire body. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, You need some lungs and eyeballs and noses and all those things. And and so often when we focus on evangelism to the point of just getting numbers and I'm, you know, I don't want to knock that too much, but we don't follow it up with teaching. And then somebody comes along and goes, oh, did you know about the Levite and the concubine? Did you know that your God condoned this or that your God? And there's no teaching to follow it up so that people can mm-hmm. can understand what's going on here. I mean, because I was always presented this particular story we're going into with the Benjamin. Oh, well, it was just necessary. Yeah, it was all part of it, God's plan. Yeah, and it's not. It, it's not. I mean, you've got to be able to read the stories and understand them in context and realize what the book of Judges as a whole is about. So, um, so speaking of that, which. That little rant was, that, I'm sorry, that's just. That's one of those things that I think I think we need to get a little better at as a church is, mm-hmm. you know. Oh, and as individuals, we need to get better at being okay with studying and realizing that if our faith really is that important to us, we're going to devote some time to it. Sure. So, so anyway, uh, yeah, we should move on. Yeah, I'll start yeah. preaching and then we'll get letters. Um, anyway, so they they gather to to cry and weep before the Lord because they realize what they've done. And when verse three, you notice the, the language of their cries, Oh, Lord, the God of Israel. Why has this happened in Israel that today we should be uh, should be one of the tribes lacking in Israel? They all but accuse God of making this happen. I mean, we're right back to Gideon responding to the angel whenever he first appears. It, it's like they have no clue how this could have ever happened. We're just clueless. And the, the answer is... You're stupid and you make bad decisions. Yeah, you make yeah. you make rash vows. Mm-hmm. Um, you carry out uh, military conquest at the drop of a hat. You know. It's... Yeah, they didn't even go to like examine, and that's that's the other thing when they when they went to ex- uh, when Sodom was being condemned. God sent two angels to examine the evidence mm-hmm. to determine mm-hmm. if the things he was hearing in heaven. We're true. Now, are we saying that God didn't know what was going on? No, we're saying God gave us an example of mm-hmm. what should have mm-hmm. been done. And the people knew this because they directly referenced Sodom when they got the pieces of the concubine. And instead of saying, oh, we know what to do, we need to go gather evidence, they just took off on this killing spree. Mm-hmm. And there, you know, there's a problem. But God's, you know, he doesn't even answer him. He's like, you know, y'all are going to sit here and be stupid. I don't even have to engage. Uh, good parenting tip, by the way. So verse four, people decided uh, that the, this lack of an answer was an answer. So they began to try to figure out what they needed to do. And their their first response is to become even more pious and try to act more holy. They They build an altar. They offer burnt offerings and peace offerings. Now, burnt offerings... Um, they're, they're offerings that are completely given to God. People don't consume any of this. Sure. This is all for God. Mike uh, Heiser calls it um, a Kickstarter. It's kind of the invitation. Hey, God, we want you to be here. Peace offerings are meals that are eaten before God, and they are to represent the unity that God has with the people. Right. And God is both kind of a host of this meal, and he's also an honored guest. And so there's kind of this this give and take that's going on. And often they're given whenever a person is trying to rehabilitate their relationship with God. Right. So it, it is an appropriate offering here. But I mean, this reminds us of Manoach and his wife when the angel of the Lord says, cook what you like. I'm not going to eat it. Right. We're not in unity. We, we have a problem here that still needs to be addressed. And I don't care how you dress it up. It, it This doesn't fix anything. Sure. Because sure. you aren't, you haven't repented, you haven't done the right thing. And again, this is what's happening here, because we're going to find out that the people, even though they're doing all these, these religious acts, their hearts aren't changed, because their solution is, well, we'll get to their solution. So um, they... They ask themselves, who wasn't at Mizpah? Who wasn't there before they went up against Benjamin? And they dis- and they identify a city, and it is, um, I don't have the list here. Mm-hmm. Um, but they remember that this, whoever didn't go up against uh, Benjamin with them, 
that they were going to kill these people. And so Jabesh Gilead? Yes, Jabesh Gilead. There. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, and since they kept the oath to go against Benjamin and not get, and the oath not to give Benjamin their daughters, it's important that they keep this oath. So they go to Jabesh Gilead and they kill everybody and everything except, except for the women. Yeah, yeah. Except for 400 women who were of age to be married. So their, <laughs> their response is that, oh, we need to get wives because we killed Benjamin because some of the men of Benjamin raped and killed another woman. So our solution is to rape and kill other people. We're going to rape four more, 400 more women and kill their families. This sounds like a great idea and a great solution. I, to who? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's like, can we mess this situation up anymore? And yeah. somebody says, yes, we can. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I mean, just the logic behind it to me is, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just so weird. It, 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 it's messed up. And that's the point of the book. Now, when all of this is happening, what, what we do need to remember, there were 600 um, Benjaminites who had fled and they were hiding out. They hid out for four months. So there is, this isn't even a heated decision. This is a decision they took four months to contemplate. Now, and by the way, that four months should remind us that in the beginning of the story, the concubine right. went to stay with her mm -hmm. father four months. So we're being reminded why this is happening. This all happened because one woman was not protected. She was abused and violated in a horrible manner. And now we're just going to, we're going to take that one little incident that happens with individuals mm -hmm. and we're going to replicate it on a national scale. This is, <laughs> but again, reminding us that in this section, everybody's the same. Right. Everybody has the exact same mindset, the exact same solutions that are going to happen. It's just, this is ridiculous. And if you're not appalled by this, because I know people who, who read through this section, and I, I can say I've even read through this section. And as you hear these numbers, you know, uh, when they go to J. Bush Gilead, they, they take 12,000 soldiers. Well, you can't even begin to wrap your mind around that. You know, even 400 women being taken hostage, how do you wrap your mind around that? Mm -hmm. We can empathize with the concubine because she's a single woman and that she's somebody we can put in a context and we, we can kind of, the individual, we, we can get behind. Right. 400 kind of becomes this blur. Mm -hmm. And that's... It's a, there's a there's a saying and it's a, one person is a tragedy mm -hmm. when hundreds are a statistic. I couldn't remember and, exactly uh, how it went. It's yeah, something of uh, something of that nature mm -hmm. where basically, you know, if if it becomes such a large problem that it just seems overwhelming, then it's just a statistic and it doesn't matter. And, Precisely, and that's, and that's unfortunately where where we're at here, which yeah. is weird. Well, and I mean, it's not saying it doesn't matter. It does matter. And it's, it was and it was a tragedy. Mm -hmm. and well, and that's the thing. It, it, it's a national tragedy that no one's seeming to realize is a tragedy. And verse 12, they, they, they take the women back to Shiloh. You know, we're no longer at Bethel where they had been offering the sacrifices and doing the prayer. They're, they're going back to Shiloh. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that Bethel had been used as a place kind of as a launch point for some of the attacks against Benjamin. Sure. So Benjamin may not have been you know, real receptive to the idea of going there, may have seen it as, as a trick. Right. So by sending them to Shiloh and saying, hey, this is, this is a holy act. Mm -hmm. This is a religious act. Look how great we're being. Now you can trust us because, you know, we're, we're on holy ground kind of idea. And, the, you know, this is the home of the Ark of the Covenants. This is the uh, home of the Levites and the priests who have been failing the nation. And, this it's significant that this is going down in a place where people were supposed to worship God and they're, they're doing this terrible thing at God's house. And I, I think we need to let that um, slip in, you know, really sink in. So anyway, verse 13 and 14, the congregation goes to Benjamin and says, you know, there should be peace between us and the women become the peace offering. And they, they kind of, there's this parallel between, oh, we offered a peace offering with God to restore relationship. Now we're going to offer Benjamin a peace offering 
so that we can restore relationship, all the while forgetting that human sacrifice was not allowed. And that's essentially what's going on here. Even though the women aren't killed, they're mm-hmm. still sacrificed for the good of the nation, quote unquote. Well, and it's it's almost like the idea that, uh, you know, this is, this is going to sound <laughs> a little, you know, it, it's like this idea of, hey, we, we've repented of our part, but, you know, if we, if we let them marry our daughters, then, then we're going to be breaking the, our vows. So we better, mm-hmm. we better make sure that our word is honored above what's right. We're, we're back to Jephthah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, we're right, right back there. And what I thought was interesting was in verse 15 when the pe- it says, And the people had compassion on Benjamin because God had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. Basically, God's being a big old meanie, but we'll take care of you. How yeah. many times do we hear that today? I mean, that's just like a smack in the face. Mm-hmm. God, God made your life hard, but I can be nice to you. Yeah. And I, I hear this a lot on Facebook, people talking about why they left the church. You know, well, what God required of me was too hard. What God wanted of me was too difficult and it hurt too much. Mm-hmm. And so somebody else comes along and says, but I can love you for who you are and what you want to do. And it's okay. Sure. And God's like, mm, no, there's standards. When you, when you are a B'nai uh, Elohim, then you, you have to behave like a son of God. Right. So they're, they're really saying the violence against the women of uh, Jabesh Gilead is necessary to make it for the cruelty of God. Yeah. And, you know, compassion is not an excuse to sin. And I see that so often in today's culture mm-hmm. where compassion is an excuse to sin. And I won't go into specific issues because you all know what they are. So, yeah. Well, and it's, I'm just, and, and the other thing is, we, and we talked about this with Japheth too. There's, there's provisions in the Torah for if you make a rash vow, mm-hmm. how, to, how to, you know. And Phineas was there. He could have annulled it. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, the, the, there was no excuse. And that's the reason why with uh, looking back now with Jephthah, we, we have the reason why he could have gotten out. Phineas was there. Sure. So, um, so verse 17, 18, the elders are concerned. There's not enough wives for the Benjamite, the Benjaminites. That's just a really awkward word. And it's unthinkable that they wouldn't have wives and an inheritance or that the, the tribe's going to be, um, blotted out, but they still, you know, they only had 400 women and they have 600 men. So they've got to find another loophole to find 200 more women Mm -hmm. because this is the solution. So verse 19, they said, behold, there is a yearly feast of the Lord, and that's Yahweh, at Shiloh, which is north of Bethel on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Lebanon. Okay, so anytime we hear the word behold, again, cringe in the book of Judges. Um, why do we have such precise directions to Shiloh? <laughs> that is, I, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that until you pointed out. It, it, well, it, every person in the nation should have known where Shiloh was. You have feasts, festivals, sacrifices that all have to be observed in Judaism, and they have to be observed in the proper place, which was Shiloh. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what this is telling you, nobody knows even where to go to worship God. Mm. Nobody understands the most basic principles. I mean, they can't even get together for a Christmas dinner, if you want to use a modern analogy. Sure. <laughs> it, it makes sense. It's This is how far removed they are from what they're supposed to be doing. So they... Again, with these great solution, uh, this is the elders now. Remember, this is the elders. And they command the people of Israel, of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in ambush in the vineyards and watch. If the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances, come out of the vineyards and snatch each man his wife from the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. Okay, this, this, there's so much in this verse that just drives me crazy. Uh, no one knows what this this dancing in the vineyards was about. Okay. The sages have suggested it's Passover, it's Sukkot, it's Yom Kippur. Uh, some scholars claim that it's a pagan festival and that these girls were um, part of the women that when we get into First Samuel, we're going to find that Eli's sons are having sex with women outside of the tents of Shiloh, the tabernacle. This, there's nothing that indicates this. Mm-hmm. But this is one way that Bible scholars have tried to make it more palatable. Well, you know, they're sleeping around anyway, so it's okay if we carry them off. Mm. 
When has that ever been okay? Only when you have messed up men. I mean, I mean this is... <laughs> yeah. And now we, most scholars do agree it's a specific group of women because it's the daughters of Shiloh, not the daughters of Israel. Sure. So th these women were probably um, somehow involved with the temple, uh, or not the temple, sorry, the tabernacle and, and the, the sanctuary there at Shiloh. We don't know how. Is, is it possible? I mean, I, I'm just curious because we already talked about Jephthah and how we don't think it was a dedication to the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Is this passage used as support for that? Have you seen that? Anywhere? I haven't seen it, but it would make sense. And, you know, it also fits with Deborah because we don't know if she really was the wife of Lapidoth or she was the fiery woman. Okay. And one of the traditions is that she was a woman who worked in the, in the temple or the tabernacle, the tabernacle yeah. and uh, braided the wicks for the, the candles. So we do know that women were active in holy places. We even see this in Jesus' birth narrative when Anna shows up at the, at the temple and she was there serving. Mm -hmm. Women stayed basically on staff to weave new wall hangings, to braid wicks, to, mm -hmm. to do a lot of the, the embroidery and finer work like that. So women did serve. Uh, they just didn't serve in a very high visibility capacity. Right. So uh, that's, but I, it bothers me that number one, that, that this is how we try to, to make it better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, I hate to even use the phrase, but the slut shaming thing that goes on that, oh, well, that's just who they are. So this is how we treat them. No, God never says that your standard of conduct is dictated by another's actions towards you. They're dictated by the standard he set for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, and one of the things he he says is that you you don't do this. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I and I, I yeah, and like you said that we've heard this taught in so many different ways, and even Bible critics coming or detractors coming against it, saying that you know we that this is something God ordained and mm -hmm. condoned, mm -hmm. and it never says that God ordains or no. condoned the elders' the, these or... actions. Yeah. yeah, the elders who we've already established are not exactly doing their job, said that this is okay. The elders fit into that place. And if we, because the story of the Levite and the concubine is the microcosm. The, this story is the macrocosm. So the elders function as the old man house get, uh, host for the house mm -hmm, who, mm -hmm. you know, oh, well, here, I'll give you my daughter and his concubine. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. They're doing the exact same thing. Again, showing you everybody's the same. Mm -hmm. And the old man in the town can't be trusted and the elders at Shiloh can't be trusted. Well, and, and the thing is, what I mean, what I find interesting is you have people giving away the things that are not theirs. Precisely. Right? And, 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 and the other thing I found interesting is, you know, the concubine's the one who gets pushed out. The, the old man's daughter apparently doesn't. Yeah. Uh, according, I mean, there's she no may indication. Have been, she may have known daddy well enough to go hide. Um, but, you know? Fair enough. So, but yeah, that, that's the thing. The, the elders all across the board are not looking out for the women. And but the sages try to soften this and say, oh, well, the reason permission is given is because the Benjaminites would have never have gone out and snatched up the woman, women out of the vineyard. The men of Gibeah had just done this. Right. <laughs> you know, right. they had just shown that, yes, absolutely, they would have. And um, the other excuse they make is that, well, these women had to, um, the women from the vineyards who were kidnapped had to consent because it was unlawful to marry a woman against her will, which is true. But when... But who's following the law at this point? I mean, and it makes a point at the very end of the book. <laughs> right. That all this is going on. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they're all doing what's right in their own eyes. And, you know, and I have... Personally, I see evidence, even within the English translation here, that this is still going on the softening of the of the event mm -hmm. because seriously the esv uses the word snatch to describe what they do to these women mm -hmm. now any other time which the word's only used one other time it's in psalms 10 9 and um, i'm going to read it it says he lurks in the in the ambush he lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket he lurks that he may seize the poor he seizes the poor when he draws him into his nest at uh, net. Here they were they use the word seize, but when it's applied to the women, they use the word snatch. Seriously, this is a questionable word choice for so many reasons. And it, it 
it's again that softening of language, mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. like when we saw with the the concubine that uh, they knew her and they abused her all night long. It, it, it's or until morning. I have never been so mad at a Bible translation as I was the ESV when I went through this and I read this because I kind of, okay, yeah, that was a weak translation with a concubine. And then I get here and I just find, I find it appalling. This is not just, you know, snatching a a fry off somebody's plate or, you know, it's none of that. It's, this is rape. Yeah. This is organized, institutionalized rape. Mm -hmm. And to, I, I felt like using that word was completely disrespectful to the event that's going on there and i i just i know the esb has come under a lot of fire by the egalitarians for for some of their wording Mm -hmm. and i had looked at a lot of those controversies honestly most of them were like i didn't care i I didn't sure (laughs) this one made me mad and i have not heard anyone else address that yeah well we are in judges yeah so i mean to be fair (laughs) not a lot of people go through this book as Thoroughly as we have. Yeah. But what were we thinking? Uh, I don't know. It was, it was a horrible, it, it, it's a horrible word to use. And again, words, the words we use matter. Mm-hmm. So, um, but they tell them, you know, go get the girls and just, you know, to be safe. Once you grab your gal, head back home. Don't, don't wait around. And w- we know what's going to happen. So they, they give verse 22, they explain what's going to happen. I want to use their words. And when their fathers, the fathers of the girls, and their brothers come to complain to us, we will say, grant them graciously to us, because we did not take for each man of, your, of his, them his wife in battle, neither did you give them to them, else you would know, uh, you would now be guilty, sorry. So basically, you know what, we know we took your daughters, but hey, you weren't guilty of anything, it's okay. Mm-hmm. As long yeah. as you're not guilty, we don't have a problem here. Forget the fact that we just took 200 women from your town and we, we relocated them to a place where there's not even a city to live in. Because it's been burned to the ground. Yeah. yeah. There, there's no food. There's no animals that, to provide milk or, you know, furs or anything like that or meat. They're going to go live with these guys and they're going to have to figure out how to survive. But that's okay because you didn't break your oath. This is... This is what happens when we start trying to justify compassion. I sin is compassion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We always create more problems than we solve. Yep. So uh, we're almost done with the chapter. We're almost done with the book. Verse 23 through 24, the most anticlimactic ending to this book, full of violence and craziness. Everyone picks up and goes home. Nothing's changed. Nothing ha- has shifted the least little bit everyone is still exactly where they began they're they're victims of this corrupt society a society that was supposed to be the gateway for the messiah into the world it's supposed to be a holy and set apart people and they're acting just like the canaanites they aren't doing anything different and benjamin is going back and they're going to rebuild these sto- these cities that have been Devoted to destruction. Mm-hmm. When a city is devoted to destruction, you're not supposed to rebuild it. So they, they're going to continue in the same ways and practices that they had been indulging in before, which began in Gibeah, the city of Benjamin, where the woman was raped and murdered. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're reminded that even though we've gone through all of these machinations to, to address this evil, the, the human response just creates more evil, and it's the same type of evil. And everyone thinks, it's okay. Yeah. And, you know, if anything, all we did in, in this whole cycle was witness just how depraved the nation had become. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like I said, the story of the concubine and the Levite, that's just the microcosm. That's what happens when we play out in the individual, um, in the individual level. And then we see, no, this isn't just an individual. This is a nation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you said that, you know, one's a tragedy, another's a statistic. And everyone has become so numb. Yeah. And and we see that thoroughly that in this time, everyone's numb. Yep. 
no one cares. And so when we have that kind of numbness, you know, the victims, um, they get obscured. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the woman, the, the concubine is not the only woman endangered. Every woman's endangered. And unfortunately, the most dangerous people to her well-being are the elders. Yeah. Well, and, and then and then you really kind of wrap it all up with everyone going, well, how did things get so bad? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, and, and it, it's all, oh, well, you know, we, we were being righteous. We were being holy. They dress it up in these, these religious clothing mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and they make a mockery of God's law concerning women because they're busy protecting the men. And what, what's important for the men? Oh, well, we made an oath. Right. Big whoop de doo Anyway, uh, but not to, you know, I, I, I could get really sarcastic because this, this whole story just made me mad. Like I said, I got s- furious. But I understand. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not a great story. I mean, it's a good, I mean, there's things to learn from it, but it's not a fun story to go through. It, so I've, I mean, overall, I will say I have enjoyed what I've learned from mm-hmm. this study. Um, so did you have anything else well, in your notes? I, I was just going to point out that, you know, the final verse is in those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And, you know, under the law of the Torah, women were valued, they were honored. And it wasn't until the nation of Israel became canonized that they were reduced to these pawns for these political gains and, mm-hmm. uh, and objects of sexual abuse. And this is why it's so fitting that the book of Samuel opens up with a woman who's going to turn the religious and political establishment on its head. Yeah. And she just shows immense courage and, and wisdom in how she does it. And this is why it's so important that we remember that when we go into first Samuel, this isn't the story of a woman who's just merely childless. Right. This is a woman who's in the culture that did all of this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we, we need to have more compassion for her than just, oh, she's childless. I mean, that's a horrible fate. But she is literally living in a time when any woman could be carried off by anyone. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, well, it's, it's a good thing. It's okay. As long as a man didn't get hurt in the process, it's fine. Right. So, right. so that's... Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a heck of a place to leave it. Um so we'll be back uh, next time. We're going to be doing kind of a recap of the whole mm-hmm. book, picking up some some stuff that we either didn't want to get off the narrative too far right. or uh, just some interesting little tidbits to throw in. Um, if you want to be part of the conversation, if you have any questions about um, judges, hit us up, ravencreeksc.com, ravencreeksc on all the social media. Um, if you really like what you heard and want to support us, um, please hit up patreon.com slash uh, Raven Creek SC, where you can hand us a few bucks to, to help keep us going. And how many dollars a month get you a coffee mug? Five bucks a month gets uh, okay. you a free coffee. Well, not a free coffee mug, but a thank you <laughs> gift from us. Um, it's personalized. We put your name right on it so it won't be confused with anyone else's mug at the office, <laughs> um, which we hope you take it to the office so people can see it. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that being said... Um, if you are not interested in giving us some monies, um, which that's totally fine, uh, you can help us out by sharing, rating us on iTunes or writing us a review. All that stuff helps us out. Um, keeps us, uh, it helps put us higher in the rankings for people to find us and, and um, encourages and us, encourages us a whole lot. And we need that after a book like this. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, um, we'll be back next week and we hope to see you or hope you see us there again the camera only goes one way but hit us up on social media in the meantime thanks bye Bye. you've been listening to the faith and other oddities podcast a raven creek social club production don't forget to follow us on facebook twitter and instagram if you like what you've heard please write us a review on itunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.